Off to the West Indies, off to holiday paradise. Today we return to the Caribbean and talk about football in the Bahamas. More than 700 islands belong to the country, 30 of which are inhabited. Today we take a look at how football is played there. Today's destination is the Bahamas, located near the USA and Cuba in the Caribbean. Almost 400,000 people live in the country and the main economic sectors are tourism and banking. Many people dream of a holiday there because the beaches are fantastic and the weather is almost always sunny. But we don't want to talk about holidays and beaches today because today we're talking about football on the island. The sport was made famous by veterans of the First World War who got to know football during their deployment in Europe. At that time, the Bahamas was still a British colony. In the 1920s and 30s, the first clubs were founded and the first matches took place on the island. The sport got a boost in the 1940s, especially the Boxing Day Soccer Classic between two best teams, St. George's and Vikings, became popular. The sport continued to grow and in 1954, the first attempts were made to establish an association and league. The Bahamas Amateur Football Association was formed and the association included 6 to 10 teams. You see, football has developed from the beginning. But what is its current status? How popular is it with the population at the moment? I asked Julio Jameson, one of the best keepers on the island. He has already played a few times for the national team and is also goalkeeper for the Bahamas national beach soccer team. At the end of March, he also started in goal in the friendly match against Saint-Martin. Prior to COVID, um, the, the football in the Bahamas was growing rapidly. Uh, mind you, Bahamas is made up of over 700 islands and keys, all right? Mainly New Providence, which is the capital island. That's the one that has most developed football. Um, Freeport is next, but it's not as it's not as much. Um, but the other islands are lagging behind. They're more so the youths on the other islands are more so focused on track and field and basketball. As far as people recognizing us on the streets, um, I'd say the people have short term memory. If there is a current tournament happening, they would immediately pick us up. Now, as time passed, they might you know forget, but yeah. Say if there's a tournament for like a month prior or a month after, we'd, we'd be easily recognized in the field. He has also gained some experience in the past in the BFA Senior League, the country's top league. This has existed since 2008, before which the champions were determined in deciding matches. At that time, the winners of the New Providence Football League and the Grand Bahama Football League competed against each other to determine the champion. Most recently, the BFA Senior League like so many others, had to take a break because of COVID and no team is currently represented internationally. In the current Caribbean club shield, the champion could participate, but no Bahamian representative is taking part this year. In the past, the only time a Bahamian team has participated internationally was in 2015. Renegades FC participated in the group stage and put in a solid performance. They finished second in a group with Don Bosco of Haiti, USR of Guadeloupe and Hellenites of the US Virgin Islands, but missed out on the semi-finals. Since then, no team has appeared in international competitions. Here too, hopes rest on the CONCACAF Champions League reform, which could give smaller federation members greater opportunities. The ball has been resting on the island for some time and a breath of fresh air in club football would be important as Marcel Joseph, another international player, also told me. He said, the structures that are in place can be a lot better. When I was younger, coming up, it was a good league. It's not fully professional and I think it's more like a hobby than a profession for guys on most teams. Definitely, much more than a hobby is the national team, where only the most talented players in the whole country make it. Julio tells us how he sees his team stacking up against other teams in the Caribbean. I, I think it's 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 doable, especially with the Nation League coming up. One of our problems prior to the Nation League was actually finding games to play. 
be us being a low ranking team to find the game to play that will sub- substantially bring us up to ranking was harder to find. The fact that the nation league comes around and offers games um, by where you could go up stages and stages give us those opportunities. Now, with that being said, we we you should see a rise to Bahamas going up that that FIFA ranking. The history of the national team dates back to 1970, when the first international match was played against Puerto Rico. The match was played as part of the Central American and Caribbean games, and in that tournament there were three straight defeats. One year later, however, at the Pan American Games, the team had its first victory against the Dominican Republic. Over the years, these local tournaments were the only appearance of the national team because it took a long time before they took part in the qualification for the Gold Cup and the World Cup. Their first qualification was for the 1999 Caribbean Cup, but they failed in the second round. This meant that they had no chance of participating in the Gold Cup the following year also. The next big debut was the World Cup qualification for the 2002 tournament in Japan and South Korea. The team won against Anguilla in the first round, but then suffered a heavy defeat against Haiti in the second round. To date, participation in a major international tournament is still missing from the Bahamas to-do list, but hope was raised by the first edition of the 2019-2020 CONCACAF Nations League. Bahamas were placed in League C, but managed to advance to League B in a group with Bonaire and the British Virgin Islands. They are now in a group with Trinidad and Tobago, Nicaragua and St. Vincent and the Grenadines in the upcoming edition. Julio takes a look into the future for us. Actually, this year Gold Cup, we were pretty close. We were all we, we were almost there. Um, so give us, give us. I, I'd say for the Gold Cup, give us another three to four years for that. For the World Cup, it, ten ten years is a better, you know, just to be safe. Give us that ten year mark. But yeah, we're 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 moving we're moving towards it. Off the pitch, Bahamas football and in particular the association also made a big appearance. Federation President Anton Seeley and Vice President Fred Lund, for example, were involved in the so-called Caribbean Football Union corruption whistleblower story. The then president of the Asian Football Confederation, Mohammed bin Hammam, addressed the representatives of the Caribbean Football Union at an event in order to secure votes for the upcoming election for FIFA president. During the event, Vice President Lund was handed a brown envelope that read Bahamas. The envelope contained $40,000 cash, and Lan immediately reported this to his president. He then informed CONCACAF General Secretary Chuck Blazer. Lan also took a photo of the envelope and gave it to the press. The Tribune then praised the two men for not accepting the envelope. I now quote from an article from that time. The attempted bribe was an insult to the whole Caribbean. Those seeking the Caribbean Football Federation's vote obviously saw its members as coming from poor island nations who would never have seen so much money as fell from the brown envelope that was offered them. Many proved to their tempters that poor they might be, but they had pride, they had integrity and although they might have never seen so much money again, under such tainted conditions they would never stoop as low as to pick it up. As was pointed out, $40,000 for the Caribbean smaller nations would be the equivalent of several years' salary. But we don't want to end today's video with that, so I'll let Julio take the floor again to explain how we can imagine a home game for the national team in the Bahamas. We have a, we have a good sized stadium, the stadium that um, hosted the first two or three world relays, that's where we play our home games. So it's a very, it's very big, beautiful stadium. Um, in terms of that, now home games are very, the, the fans are always into it. Whether we're winning or losing, they're always there. <laughs> Last game I remember was Turks and Caicos where we, we won 6 1. The fans were amazing. Um, it's, it's, it's electric. It's, it's electric. It's an amazing, it's an amazing place to be. And most of the teams that come here also enjoy it. Whether they win or lose, it's always a good, it's, they always enjoy it. Football should be the focus. The criminal machinations around it are hurting it more than enough as it is. That's why it was great fun for me once again to talk about football in the Bahamas. Our world tour is far from over. And next we will travel to one of the most populous countries on earth with more than 1 billion inhabitants. So subscribe to my channel to make sure you don't miss it. See you then.